Uh, Jaihind sir, and uh, I would like to thank Sanjaws for uh, hosting this seminar, and special thanks to uh, General Bhatia, Director Sanjaws, for making us get together on this webinar on this Saturday morning. And uh, we have galaxy of speakers when we speak in the session contours of aerial threats. Uh, we have Mr. Neer Banhat from Rafael Industries here to join us. We have Brigadier Ayer as a replacement to Colonel Bhatia. We have Amit Javde. Uh, senior manager of BD from Sarova Advanced Materials, Pune. We have Group Captain Malhotra here sitting adjacent to me uh, from Air Headquarters. And we have uh, Colonel Kuber, sir, who's from Ernst & Young, who talk about the industry perspective. Uh, since I can only see about uh, three speakers on the line, so uh, maybe I'll request, uh, in the sequence, we have not uh, have Mr. Neer Banahat on line yet. If Brigadier Ayer is online, maybe I'll request him to start this session. Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, with the permission of the chair, uh, I, I am actually standing in for Colonel Bhatia because of some technical issues. He could not join, but having served in the uh, Army Air Defense for 35 years, I, I thought... Uh, I will give it a go without uh, any preparation. So please, I don't have any slides. I will I will try and put across my uh, views on the contours of air threats, uh, which I, uh, from the experience which I have had. Now, when we talk of contours of threats, the changes in electronics and the aerial threats are two areas where the contours have been changing at a speed which may not have been seen in other areas or other arenas. In this context, I must start with a small cartoon which I had read a few years back, which states that when the Wright brothers were giving finishing touches to uh, or busy conducting the flight trials, their third renegade brother was giving finishing touches to the first anti-aircraft gun. So that's the nature of aerial threats that we talk about. So my focus today will not be on the aerial vehicles themselves, but the technological threat from the air that makes these vehicles or the missiles so very potent. Essentially, what we face today is a technology-driven air threat. The end result is that modern fighters, attack captors, have acquired all weather capability of delivering a wide array of lethal armaments with precision, with little or no warning, even in a close electronic warfare, dense electronic warfare and lethal air defense environment. If we talk about aircrafts first, uh, the development in avionics, which are primarily the electronic system used on aircraft, there have been major technological evolutions specifically in the field of navigation, wherein to overcome the inaccessibility of the GPS due to enemy action or otherwise, the development in form of chip scale combination, combinatorial atomic navigator, it's quite a mouthful, or we very fondly call it as C-scan, which seeks an atomic inertial sensor to measure the orientation in the GPS denied environments. So the aircraft can work in an environment where there is no GPS or they can use the NAVSOC program, which performs GPS independent operations in calculating the position of the aircraft and making use of hundreds of different signals that are available in the environment. In the field of monitoring, a synthetic vision system has been developed, which is a cockpit display technology that presents the visual environment external to the aircraft using computer-generated imagery. And in the field of flight control, evolution of the adaptive flight control system and hands-on throttle stick, or what we call as OTAS, and helmet-mounted display systems allow the pilots to obtain situational awareness and provide more accuracy for use of the weapon system. What I mean here is, with this technological innovation and uh, addition to the aircraft, they become that much more uh, potent in terms of aerial threat. As regards to various other sensors, 
once we talk of the airborne radars we have to talk about active electronically scanned array radar which is now the basic on every radar or we can have the lidar technology with the multiple applications which dominate the environment today the electro optical system have been getting better by evolving and utilizing techniques like hyperspectral imaginary imagery focal plane arrays or cloud or foliage detection communication systems has seen a very new high by advent of the terahertz electronics programs the transformational satellite communication system and of course the software defined radios uh, the in the field of integrated sensor structure we have the wide area airborne surveillance system or the wass which are path breaking technology designed to provide persistent wide area surveillance tracking and engagement of hundreds of time critical air and ground targets the reach of the aircraft therefore has become our as increased manifolds courtesy the development in propulsion system the integrated high performance turbine engine and the scramjet technology which have evolved these aircraft into hypersonic planes which can achieve speeds up to 15 max and thus have changed the tactical dynamics coming to the engine or the adaptive engine technology we have the uh, morphing program which employs fully integrated nanotechnology enabled embedded smart materials and actuators that will change the shape of the aircraft wings to continually optimize flying conditions we may not be having these in our uh, scenario today but these are advancements in future fuel technology and platforms which will actually increase the operational efficiency of these aircrafts there have been rapid advancements to increase the survivability aspect of the aircraft too and consequently the electronic warfare suit has now been integrated or incorporated as uh, a compulsory item in all the aircrafts the integrated defense electronic countermeasure system incorporates both on board receiver and off board countermeasures a missile approach warning system which gives out accurate angle of approach in the shortest time and miniature air launch decoys that accurately duplicates the combat flight profiles and signatures of the aircraft to an enemy integrated ad system thereby deceiving the air defense the mrca of course is now being replaced by the fifth generation fighter aircraft even when the sixth generation is already on the drawing board these will have on board command control communications computers intelligence surveillance you name it recce and decision making capability along with the compatibility with a network centric con ops allowing these aircraft to process data and make informed decisions much more rapidly than the fourth generation aircraft coming on to helicopters driven by the electric electrifying movement and stinging with raw firepower the attack raptors or the ats define the next threat dimension we are very happy that already our attack raptors are in the uh, arena of uh, so called threat in the northern sector the signature features include composite material providing crash worthiness and limited ballistic tolerance to air defense fire noise suppressed engines provides stealth fully packaged ew and warning system thereby enhancing their survivability and also they have a all weather precision strike suit to deliver the effective fire with precision of course they have the drawbacks of low speed high noise and high vibration which do exist however these drawbacks are being addressed through development of counter rotating wings and various other technologies coming on to the uav ucavs which are also a major aerial threat of late multi role air from platforms are encompassing one or more functional categories such as recce combat logistics etc today the uavs are being planned for surface strikes against high value heavily defended time critical targets or for countering weapons of mass destructions in their storage or assembly areas definitely they uh, save our fighters and the fighter pilots but the uavs like 
the predator RQ1, MQ1, or MQ9, Reaper, Hunter Killer, UCAV are also being used to launch mini UAVs. Various technological developments are also taking place, such as sensor fusion, communications, trajectory generation, task allocation, allocation with the ultimate goal of autonomy, that is the use of artificial intelligence technologies to eliminate the need for ground-based pilots and help overcome the vulnerability of the UAV to communication links that can be jammed. Interoperability aspect also allows the Hepter or the aircraft pilot to control a drone, access its streaming video and use its sensors for target engagement while in flight, thus no longer relying on the voice information from the UAV operators for situational awareness. Coming on to armament aspects, the PGMs or the smart or intelligent ammunition with pinpoint capability are the combat arsenal of the future, both for aircraft as well as helicopters and the UAVs. With standoff ranges crossing more than 120 kilometers and precision accuracy in sub-meter range, these weapons guided on infrared, laser or inertial technologies with sensor-fused intelligence provide the modern fighter a devastating position fire and standoff capability. I, I still remember when uh, we had joined Army Air Defense, the aircraft were expected to come multiple, multiple times on to the target to uh, do their attack. That was way back in 1983-84. But today, uh, no such uh, case exists with this kind of uh, precision armament available with the aerial threats. And of course, missiles are another uh, important aspect of the aerial threat. The surface-to-surface -surface missiles as part of the triad represent the strategic deterrent, of course. And it requires a full-fledged ballistic missile defense system to address them. But closer home, we have the cruise missiles, which represent a major threat dimension, where trends point to a fast growth in deep and precision strike capability. These weapons are becoming dangerously potent with features like terrain contour mapping, digital scenario matching, active terminal homing providing accuracy of less than 10 meters at hundreds of kilometers. Then we come to uh, the directed energy weapons. Of course, it is an exciting world still. The future threat will emerge along three prongs, that is high energy laser weapons, microwave energy weapons, and charged particle beams. The airborne lasers weapons are already a reality on board the Boeing airborne laser program. The E-bomb represents the future of the threat this threat dimension as it generates the electromagnetic pulse capable of disrupting and paralyzing an entire range of electric and electromagnetic system against the air defense or the ground targets. Coming on to data warfare, as the weapons of the future start to appear at the cutting edge of technology, a subtle shift can be noticed wherein the weapons in the sensory domain of radiation warfare and hard kill are grudgingly beginning to accommodate weapons in data warfare and soft kill. This change probably saw its first manif manifestation in September 2007, although it's now old, but I keep repeating myself because this is a very interesting case uh, during the Israeli data warfare attack, or also called as ETAC, on the Syrian air defense facilities using the uh, Suter series of programs, which involved beaming electronic pulses in the victim surveillance and fire control system with a view to feed disinformation. You can call it as the coronavirus, if you say, if you may, in the battle management and the ADC and our system grid. This resulted in total deception of the air defense networks, which were fed false targets, allowing the actual aerial attack on serial nuclear facility to go unhindered and unaddressed. Of course, airspace battle management with the situational awareness capability and the integrated uh, aerial platform, it's now possible to direct airstrikes by any weapon system within the TBA or the close air support missions, whether the weapons are carried by air or ground platforms. 
The future operations, therefore, will have much required integration of the AVAX with the JSTARS. Of course, we don't have, but I'm quoting the American uh, um, technology for integrating air and land system command and control system with, into a single platform along with decision making to further make the OODA loop compact, faster and decisive. Of course, the aspect of unconventional air threat is also a must to be talked about here. Taking a cue from the present geopolitical crisis, unconventional air attacks, primarily the non-state actors and LTT come into my mind, or the rocket attacks by the Hamas in Gaza, further support the belief in building a CRAM system, which is important for the future. Coming to the uh, concluding part, technologically intense battlefield actually warrants an integrated and holistic approach to the air defense. The Army Air Defense, therefore, has a pivotal role in containing and degrading not only the enemy's aircraft, but also a plethora of sophisticated air armaments and hectares. So when we look for the future of the air defense, we have to keep this technology-laden aerial threats which, are, which we are going to face in the future. Thank you very much. Uh, Brigade, I uh, must thank you that you're able to plug into the network, share the future challenges which we have at hand. Uh, Brigade, I thanks a lot for giving us a perspective on the future threats we have. And uh, then I move on to the next speaker. I will call upon Mr. Amit Javade to speak. A little introduction on Amit. Amit is a product manager for defense aerospace, uh, nuclear tool and die segments. He is focused on niche and high-value remelted steel products. He is a postgraduate from IIM Calcutta and B.Tech from COP Pune. Over to Amit. The journey to manufacture high-quality weapons starts from the right raw material. To get absolutely reliable, world-class end product, you need world-class raw material. And that is where we come into play. We are Sarloa Advanced Materials Private Limited, a specialty steel producer for defense and aerospace applications. My agenda here is very brief. Uh, I will give you a short introduction about the company facilities, particularly focusing on aerospace and defense applications. Very interesting new products that we are developing at Sarloa, followed by concluding remarks. Coming, starting from the introduction. Sir, we are part of the Kalyani group. This is a $3 billion group based in Pune. You may, many of you may be knowing us from our erstwhile name, Kalyani Carpenter Special Steel Private Limited, which was a joint venture between Kalyani group and Carpenter USA. In 2016, Kalyani group bought out Carpenter's stake and currently it's a 100% Kalyani group entity. We are a special steel producer for defense, aerospace, nuclear, engineering, and other industrial applications. We have a complete gamut of steel, right from carbon and alloy steels, stainless steels, tool and die steels, uh, remelted steels, precipitation hardened steels, even in alloys. We produce various shapes such as round bars, squares, blocks, hollows, tubes, etc. This company was established in 1973 as a backward integration to the Bharat, to Bharat Forge, which is the flagship company of Kalyani Group. So we have more than four decades of experience in steel making. We have state-of-art manufacturing facilities in Pune. Interestingly, we also have remelting facilities, which are electro slag remelting as well as vacuum arc remelting. These facilities are required to produce steel for critical applications such as defense and aerospace. <clears throat> We are very focused on quality, quality of our products, as well as our internal processes. As of today, our capacity stands at 2,40,000 tons per annum. Coming to our capability, sir. First, just wish to mention that, you know, we are an approved and regular suppliers to various ordnance factories, such as Ambajari, Kanpur, Abdi. We are also an approved supplier for Hindustan Aeronautics Limited. Brahmos Aerospace, NPCIL, BARC, as well as ISRO. Few of the relevant 
end applications in which our steel is used would be you know gun barrel this we have supplied steel for gun barrels uh, for artillery guns which are which were developed by bharat forge we have supplied pre forms or tubes which were used uh, for pinaka missiles body applications our steel is also used regularly for by ordnance factory ambajari for shells we have also supplied steel for h2 hvf audi for torsion bars for t72 t90 tanks we have also supplied steel to chandrayaan 1 which was a successful mission by isro and uh, very interestingly sir uh, isro is going to put a indian man in space under its gaganyaan project our supplies have already started for that we have supplied steel for couplings rotor couplings for aviation sector and we are also developing steel for rocket casing application uh, along with drdl we are very proud to contribute to make in india initiative by supplying to nationally important and reputed organizations which you see on the screen many of which have been included in previous slide coming to facilities at sarloha which have, we have a fully integrated steel plant right here in pune it is based on 35 metric ton electric arc furnace route we have two ladder furnaces vacuum degassing vacuum oxygen decarburization in secondary refining we have two casting routes one is continuous cast the other one is ingot cast we have two esr furnaces and one vacuum arc remelting furnace we have two rolling mills we also have full fledged heat treatment furnaces as well as peeling facility our quality lab are fully equipped and enable accredited where we can do all sorts of testing required by customer requirements or as per specifications here we we can do you know mechanical testing chemical testing corrosion testing even material characterization this slide is regarding our state of art electro slag remelting furnace so this is used this furnace is used for very critical applications uh, the applications which which are talked about earlier such as gun barrel steel pinaka missile body submarine walls for uh, ba to barc are all from esr furnace most of our supplies to isro are also from esr furnace for those who wish to know more about this technology uh you know i uh, welcome you to our booth or you can contact me directly and we can discuss it at length as to you know how we achieve the superior properties required by uh, various applications second very important equipment which we have is vacuum arc remelting furnace or the var this is also state of art furnace imported from ald germany this furnace is under used to develop steel for missile casing application which i talked about earlier and also we are developing steel for landing gear application for aviation sector sarloha has been certified by various in national as well as international institutions we have narcap accreditation for hydrogen determination in titanium alloys we have various iso certifications shipping related certifications we our laboratory is enable accredited as i mentioned earlier we also have as 9100d certification which is a prerequisite for any aerospace application we are also approved vendors of ordnance factories these are various steels which we have developed for defense aerospace oil and gas energy and industrial applications of course this is a truncated list not an exhaustive list but uh, just to give you a glimpse of you know what the capability of our company is now coming to our r&d this is a very important factor within the kalyani group as well as sarloha we take Uh, quality R and D new product development very very seriously. The two centers which you see on the screen are Kalyani Center for Technology and Innovation and the other one for Manufacturing Innovation are state of art centers right here in Pune, where we do cutting edge research on various aspects right from basic sciences to you know advanced metallurgy. Here just to give you some examples. we do uh, we use nano we are using nanotechnology to improve mechanical properties of steel 
we have a team working on improving lithium ion battery efficiency for electric vehicles we also have 3d printing or it is as it is called as additive manufacturing facilities we also have metal injection molding facilities in these centers apart from this we have a we have a you know full fledged team of scientists which are working on various aspects of you know metallurgy and steel making here we also have full fledged library where we can you know access any literature around the world this is a very very interesting slides these are all the new grades which sarloha is developing many of these grades are proprietary grades where we have developed the right from chemistry and you know molded it to the uh, uh, application which are required uh, each and every steel grade is a universe in itself but i would like to just take two examples on this slide the second line atom which you see is k170 which is nothing but dmr 1700 this is an ultra high strength steel with a very high fracture toughness this we are we are developing to replace maragin steel which is a very very costly steel and used very widely in defense and aerospace applications so the idea here is sir, to achieve the same mechanical and uh, you know fracture toughness and strength properties as maragin steel but by using a very very lean chemistry and and which will you know uh, uh, which will provide a very competitive pricing of the product so very interesting project this will be used for missile casing application and once it is developed it can be used for many other applications as well the second example i would like to highlight here is the last one which you see is 300m this is the steel again is a very high strength steel this will be used for landing gear in civilian and military aircrafts uh, currently all of these steel is imported in india and we have taken the uh, challenge to develop this within our group and uh, these as well as global companies sir uh, the the message with all these slides that we wish to give to the audience and to the distinguished members of the panels is that you know the metal forming the steel making and the r&d capability which exists in kalyani group and sarloa is phenomenal and because of that sarloa is a preferred steel mill for any new product development within india as well as any import substitution which our uh, customers or new customers uh, want to do by virtue of our metallurgical expertise and our knowledge base we can suggest solution rather than just you know producing you know what, what you ask for so if you have any end use in mind we can you know provide a very highly customized steel raw material if you have a very particular mechanical properties or when let's say a corrosion property you need in your end uh, you know end application we will suggest you a steel grade or if not we will develop a steel grade for you very interestingly sir i would like to mention we have a 100 kg prototype induction furnace within our company which we use for r&d purpose so there we do all sorts of experiments with the chemistry and we see you know what kind of chemistry gives what kind of mechanical and you know other properties so you know uh, if you have any certain application in mind our team is fully equipped to go into details and suggest the right material for you now with this sir finally the message we wish to give is to give, give to you is you know there is there is world class steel making facility and technology available in india for example sarloha hence we urge and request ordnance factory boards as well as various other defense industry companies to collaborate more with indian companies for their all their raw material needs and we are not asking for you know compromise on quality however we are just asking for optimum opportunities and you know deeper interaction so once we have that collaboration and one ongoing dialogue and interaction you know so together we can go from importing material to import substitution and having a single tender or a nomination basis orders to a wider participation within indian companies from make in india we can make for the world and export to global companies from making existing products we can develop newer products which are which were not even you know invented 
so we have a lot of potential to cover with this i close my presentation and assure that we at sarloha are committed to make india atmanirbhar in its defense and aerospace raw material needs thank you Uh, amit uh, thanks a lot for giving a insight into salhua and the kind of work you are doing in metallurgy and uh, the chemistry part of it i think you will make uh, you really make us proud in and on the path of atmanirbhar bharat good to know that the grades of steel you have like the k170 the k150 and the 300m plus i'm sure the participants who are there and the industry partners who are networked with us will definitely listen to you and uh, will join up with you and within the services if we have any customized need we'll definitely approach you and thanks a lot and we are really proud of you and your industry thank you now we shift onto the new speaker you, and uh, i can see neer having joined us networked with us and that is the part of air defense we will to identify and neer we can see you good to you uh, have you back a uh, little bit about neer Uh, Neer is a director of business development and marketing. He is a customer support center of Rafale Advanced Defense Systems, and he is going to talk to us about the air defense optimizer. He has served as a major at the Israeli air defense between uh, 2000 and 2007. He was an officer of the Joint Task Force Planning and Operation Team. He served as the battery commander and in the officers' training school. is involved in developing air defense systems in the rafale advanced defense systems since 2007 uh, over to neer banat thank you sir good morning everybody um i'm going to present my uh, slides in a moment okay so today i'm going to present the operational air defense optimizer I'm proud to be uh, part of Rafael who is a leading sponsor for the event uh, for the past few years and I invite you to go into our booth of making India and Rafael uh, linked on the left. So the first thing I want to discuss is the challenge of planning an uh, aerial air defense. Uh we have uh, several challenges when we do that. uh that combine the fact that we have many air defense systems such as uh, cannons uh, rockets missiles uh anti drones many different systems that belongs to different OEMs with different capabilities and therefore different missions the missions themselves have different parameters that we need to take into account while planning an aerial air defense we need to defend many assets that don't wait the same uh we have different cause uh, keep out zones whether they're static or dynamic around our friendlies we have numerous air defense systems per mission and we really want to maximize the efficiency of the aerial air defense array another thing that we have a challenge with is the enemy threats we have many type of threats from drones to uav pgms aircraft rockets we have changing threats so we need to take into account every threat that comes into our arena into account when we want to maximize our air defense we see today in the world that we have a more complex more massive scenario attacks where we see examples of uh, many uh, uavs uh, attacks uh, like we see in saudi arabia like we see when uh, the us attacks uh, an area where they shoot many many um, cruise missiles glide bombs and so on uh we know we don't know sorry the angle of attack of the enemy these are the challenges that we need to cope with when we go and plan an aerial air defense if we look on our defense array we can see that we are planning on a layered defense where we have the very short range to the long range defense we need to take all of these systems and all of these layers into account when we play an aerial uh, defense array of different systems coping with different threats now when we look on technology today 
we're looking then what can we harness in order to plan and maximize our air defense array. So one of the first things that we look into is artificial intelligence. Some BI uh, and uh, big data alternative analysis. We want to combine the multi-system agile algorithms that can be adapted to changes in the battlefield. We need something that is fast and easy to use and uh, that we can support on it before, during, and after combat. We need something that can give us results fast that will affect our current battle. Each user needs its own independence to create or edit entities. We don't want to be uh, obliged to go to the OEM to introduce a new target or to introduce a new scenario. We want our own independence to do it on our own, not necessarily willing to share our secret information with OEMs. And we need to harness the technology that can cope with the saturated scenarios of different targets. For example, if I have an air-breathing targets and ballistic missile uh, attack upon me, I would like to plan for both simultaneously and see how I cope with the real threat in the battlefield. We have a solution for the problems and the challenges that we have uh, suggested. We have taken over 70 years of experience, operational experience that we have here in Israel and in Rafael specifically, in building missiles, planning them, developing, producing and intercepting. Unfortunately, in my country, it's a day-to-day -day thing. We know how to create the mission analysis in high fidelity, and we have tested it, and we know that the results that we're getting are really close to what we get in real life, over 90%. We're using an AI that we developed to combine the performance and the optimization. And I will go into that further in a few slides. Near real-time performance uh, is an emphasis that we put in this uh, uh, system so that we can support on it in real combat. And I'll get results in a matter of seconds to maximum a few minutes. And we want to analyze the defense capability on various aspects, whether it's detection, interception, uh, marginal effect of the participants and so on. I will go into the movie for a moment, so I have to go out and come back again with the movie slides. Today's air defense arena is constantly changing. With new threats, tactics, and systems evolving rapidly. In these conditions, planning an air defense mission is a time-consuming challenge, requiring valuable resources and vast knowledge on multiple systems. Raphael presents the Operational Air Defense Optimizer, an innovative, easy-to-use app that makes air defense planning fast efficient and accurate. Optimizer can combine systems and armaments from multiple manufacturers and offers full customization of new systems, so your arsenal can be used to its maximum potential. With Optimizer's cutting-edge algorithms, planning an operational air defense deployment takes no more than a few seconds. And you're set with accurate coordinates for your systems based on performance, terrain, and armament status. Optimizer comes with built-in debriefing tools, including what-if scenario analysis capabilities. It can easily run on any tablet, PC, or laptop with no need for cumbersome servers. And with its easy-to-use interface, real-time defense optimization is right at your fingertips. Optimizing decision-making processes, reducing costs and resources, advanced analysis capabilities, supported by Raphael's unmatched operational experience. Raphael's Operational Air Defense Optimizer. Maximize your air defense performance. Then we add the scenario that we want to check. 
whether it's DMD areas like the hostile one and two or air breathing targets that we see with the lines. We introduced the keep out zones that we want to uh, enforce on the algorithm. And then we calculate and get the results. What you see here is three different batteries. Each color represents a unit, a squadron. I will focus on the blue squadron now. We see that we have three launchers. We have one a radar and two communication centers. In this case, I want to check my um, ability, which is 85% to intercept all targets. Now, if my launcher goes down, launcher number one, let's take him out of the game, we will see that we dropped to 60%. This thing you will see live in the system in a matter of seconds. Now, what I can do is ask the system if this is down, for whatever reason it is, if it was shut down, out of ammunition, needs to reload, malfunction, can I do anything else until I get back with that launcher into operational mode? All I need to do is do analyze, and you would see that launcher two position changed here, and I got a PK of 80% instead of the 60. So in this case, I can see what I can do live during combat, before or after, and what I can do else in the restrictions that I have at the moment to do better, maximizing my air defense performance. Now in these systems, we basically work with two things. First thing is the entities that I create. In the entities that I create, I put in all the parameters of the entity. For example, a sensor, which is a radar type. I need to set up the ranges, the, B, the BD, the phase array or pools, uh, Doppler, all the parameters of the radar. Once I do that and save it, I will use it later in my scenario. Same goes for the effector, launchers, cannons, shells, rockets, missiles. I set them up in the entities, then I can use them in the scenario. Same goes for the threats, whether they're ABTs or BMD. I create them in the entities. Later on, I will use them in the scenarios. The entities usually in uh, the Air Force are done by the research and development or intelligence uh, team, where this is used by the operators. This section is, is a circle that we go through when we want to decide, plan, or investigate, analyze this, the uh, defense. First thing I need to do is set up my defense array. I need to assign systems and uh, missions. I need to set up which unit is subordinate to which unit all the way from the Air Force to the unit. I need to set up the rules of engagement and the policy that I want to do. For example, this system only shoots ABTs. That system only shoots BMDs, um, and so and so. We need to create the scenario, the assets, the keep out zones, the threats, the deployment areas. Deployment areas is the polygons where I allow the system to deploy the air defense systems. The outcome of this will be uh, the pinpoint positions on where to locate my uh, units, my launchers, my radars, my communications. I can see the overall performance of the array is 85% comparing to the threat that I've introduced. On the right, I would see the analysis of the high defended assets, medium defended assets, low defended assets, and how well they are defended. I would see how many targets were calculated, how much I intercepted or detected. I would see the reasons why I have not succeeded in the mission, and I can investigate. I will zoom in for a moment so you can see that for each launcher, we have a percentage in talk, saying it's marginal effect to the query that we're running right now. We can see that a launcher L3 has only 12% impact, whether L31 launcher has 52%. At the moment, we're looking at an analysis of interception, but with one click, I can see the same analysis for detection, and you can see the detection is 
And the same analysis goes for all the area for detection. I can set up the PK that I call an interception. If I have over 75%, 90%, 60%, then I will call an interception, and the map will change accordingly live. Here, I can click on the graph, and all the high assets will be taken into account, and I will see their personal results, reasons for failure, and the participants, which are colored white, that uh, affect these assets. So I can specifically analyze the assets that I'm looking into. I can take just a single asset and then analyze it. And you can see that in this case, one uh, rocket was outside of the asset. That's why I couldn't intercept it. And eight did not meet the performance capability of the effectors. So I could not intercept it. I can see that different units have a, mar a different marginal effect for this asset, where in this point, I can see that this launcher only contributes 5%. So I could take a decision not to deploy it, save the flight hours of the unit, and maybe increase the availability of missiles in this site, where I see that it has a marginal effect of 92%. In this case, I can take decisions on how to save my units, how to save the hours, how to save munition, and better use it. Same goes for the detection. I can put a detection array and then check the sensitivity of each radar, like we see here, that contributes 82%, where this radar, R3, only contributes 64%. So I can also plan and manage my detection array, not only my interception array. I can check the attacks analysis with just clicking on it. And on the right, I would see the attacks, the marginal effect, my capability to that uh, attack with my entire defense array. I can see which type of targets each one of them contains. And when I say a target, you see two points lined on the map, but physically it's a tube. It has a diameter. And in that diameter, in the algorithm, I run 1,000 Su-30, 1,000 MiG-29 or more, so I would have a better statistics. And in that tube, they do different maneuvering in order to hit the target that they're looking for. If I'll focus here on the uh, attack analysis, I can go to a specific anal uh, attack analysis, and I have the graph. The graph is height to range, or I can still uh, do height versus time. And in that, I would have the colors of detection, tracking, interception, and loss. And in that trajectory of the target, at any given time, I would see which sensor saw it, detected, tracked it, uh, classified it, and so on. And if specifically, I would click a point on the graph, I will see it on the timeline of the sensors and see who saw what and when and at what stage did they classify it or track it. So I can investigate the specific target that goes into a specific line, or I can do the bunch of targets going into a specific, specific line. Every time that I do a filterization, the players will be highlighted where the Items that do not play a game in what I'm analyzing will be darkened. So it's easier to see, simpler to use. I can do the same thing for a launcher. If I click the launcher, I can see specifically this launcher, which one are here. So I will also know that, and I will know before I take it out of the game, what is the meaning of that means I will lose 12% of the defended assets, 8% here and 8% here of the defended assets uh, regarding this launcher. I would have the rest of the launchers protecting them, but not through this. So what are the benefits of such a system? I can plan the policy that I want to use. I can analyze scenarios that happen or that I think that will happen in the future in current times. I can take the output from the system, boot it into this Air Defense Optimizer and analyze it. I can do the defense planning 
And I can do offense planning, because basically if I put the enemy's defense array, I can plan my routes and my attack patterns to intercept the targets that I need in his own turf. I have a real-time high-level fidelity. As I said, we are using more than 90% today from the system, the air, the system that we're using, the Air Defense Optimizer, to the results in real life. And as I said, in our country, we have a lot of experience with that. We have a growth capability that we can add more and more systems, more and more sensors, shooters, and so on. And we will give every user admin capabilities so that they can do it on their own. What holds the future of the blocks of these systems? First thing is we're going to do maneuvering forces protection. We want to do the same analysis, the same optimization, protecting a maneuvering force. The data maze is another system that we have, which is a big data analysis, where I can load inputs from your sensors into this optimizer. It will analyze and will let you know in real time or later on, depends on your needs. If there is an anomaly in the um, behavior of the enemy, there is an anomaly in the communications, and it will tell you this has changed, and this is what I would recommend to do with the systems that you have currently to cope with this change and not um, leaving the threats that you already have. We will add a timeline, so we could add the downtime of systems, whether it's sensors, launchers, We'll have a reloading time. If I was out of munition, I will need to set up. The reload is in 12 hours. It will take that into account. We'll take into account the volleys, the waves of attacks of the enemies through the timeline. We will add air-to-air -air and ground-to-air air defense array. At the moment, we only have the ground-to-air. In the future blocks, we'll join air-to-air -air and ground-to-air air defense and maximize the performance. Thank you. Nir, thank you for a very well articulated usage of air defense resources by using big data analytics and artificial intelligence. I think it is the way ahead for us how we integrate our air defense as we had spoken earlier in the first session using air defense optimizer kind of a system where we utilize, optimize our resources in terms of planning and deployment and usage. Thank you for that. I'm sure there'll be some questions at the end of our talk and we'll take it on that time. Now I go on to the next speaker. Our next speaker is uh, Group Captain Vishal Manotra from the Indian Air Force. He's a Su-30 pilot and commanded a Su-30 squadron. And presently he is in the Directorate of Air Defense and I would uh, urge Group Captain Malhotra now to talk to us. Over to Group Captain Malhotra. Thank you, sir. Uh, just... Uh... Waiting for the slides to load up. That will come on very shortly. Mike. Yes. Uh, morning, gentlemen. In 1991, Operation Desert Storm, the coalition forces flew 100,000 sorties, dropping 85,000 tons of bombs, which comprehensively destroyed the military and civilian infrastructure of Iraq, paving way for the ground... The intelligent and effective faith of the political leadership in the use of air power as the most preferred instrument of imposing political will over the adversaries. In 2001, early in the morning of September 11, 19 hijackers took control of four long-range passenger aircraft and crashed them into prominent urban, civil and military targets inside U.S. homeland, ushering in a new era of global war on terrorism. Switch to 2019. At around 400 0400 local time, state-owned Aramco oil refineries in Abek and Khamis were hit by multiple missiles, forcing shutdown of the facilities and cutting the country's oil production by more than half, leading to a surge in the global prices by 20%. The attack was allegedly carried out by swarm drones being controlled 
from far off distances and a total of 19 DMPIs were engaged. The missile defense system based out of Abek was unable to prevent the attack. These examples define the aerial threats in the conventional and unconventional domains. The air threat is a vast topic and given the constraints of time and the kind of audience, I intend to cover the aerial threat the way it is evolving. And then we talk of evolving. First and foremost would be to bring about a change in our mindset wherein the classical air threat has to evolve to aerospace threat. We are no longer just threatened from air, but to a very large extent from the space. Being a nuclear threat, sorry, being a nuclear state ourselves and also geometrically sandwiched between two unfriendly nuclear states, nuclear threat cannot be ignored, so it forms a bullet. We will dwell upon the conventional air threats from the modern fighters and its huge arsenal of weapons. I will also outline the non-conventional threats from the ever-expanding inventory of SSMs with hypersonic capabilities and MIRV technology. The sub-conventional threat from UCAV and drones. All of these aerial threats being totally dependent on the use of space-based assets. And finally, we will correlate the impact of the emerging aerial threats are on own strategic, operational and tactical levels before briefly glancing at the existing capabilities of our unfriendly neighbors. Nuclear armed nations have developed a robust triad of weapon delivery through surface, subsurface and aerial platforms. What needs to be understood is that irrespective of the launch platform, be it the surface-to-surface missiles, submarine-launched missiles, or an aerial platform-delivered munition, the final delivery of the weapon in the target area is through the medium of air. In the conventional domain, the evolving aerial threat is from modern fighters and strategic bombers, especially from adversaries equipped with fifth-generation fighter technology. These fighters have stealth capabilities and advanced electronic warfare systems, thereby avoiding detectability and enhancing its chances of survivability. Further, these aircraft have a large arsenal of weapons that have precision and huge standoff capabilities. The aerial battle has been steadily transforming from visual range missiles to beyond visual range missiles with a steady increase in the range of missiles to in excess of 200 kilometers. These enhanced ranges of the missiles are to be supported with evolving tactics, operational art and enabling systems, both for its exploitation and as a defense. Similarly, The aerial bombs have high standoff capability with precision and that have emerged as a major aerial threat. Today, the standoff capabilities of air munitions are in excess of 200 kilometers and the precision less than 5 meters. Precision itself has defined the concept of mass. In World War II, 1,500 sorties and 9,000 bombs were utilized to Neutralize a single 100 into 60 feet target. And as we switch to Kosovo operations, a single sortie could neutralize multiple targets with one bomb each. The evolving standby capabilities, that is the standoff ranges of the weapons are making the existing doctrines and op philosophies redundant. The strategic bomber with extended ranges equipped with heavy caliber ordnance or air launch cruise missile is also a potent aerial threat. The modern aerial threat would not only be composed of manned aircraft, but teaming of manned aerial vehicle with unmanned aerial systems. 
This is primarily to overcome the range and lethality of the air defense systems, including the surface-to-air missiles and air-to-air missiles that has made aerial engagements highly risky and vulnerable. U.S. Air Force Research Laboratories have read a program on F-16 and U.S. Army Apache Attack Helicopter operationally teaming with Gray Eagle drone is indicative of the MAMTI concept picking pace globally towards operationalization. The futuristic concept of MAMTI envisions a highly networked air battle scenario, including aircraft, AVACs, UAVs, UCAVs, ground troops, and radars. Their smart sensors, collaborative automation, displays, and weapons would provide a high order of situational awareness, mission safety, and capability to undertake dangerous operations. Proliferation of long-range surface-to-surface missiles with varying degrees of accuracy and destruction capabilities pose an aerial threat to VAs and VPs that were earlier geographically cocooned by virtue of strategic depth. The threat from these missiles has been adequately analyzed and mitigation measures adopted. However, the bigger threat that emerges is from the MIRV technology and the development of hypersonic missiles and hypersonic glide vehicles. Multiple independently targetable re-entry vehicle, MIRV, is a single missile with a payload of multiple warheads, each capable of engaging different target. This technology reduces the effectiveness of the anti-ballistic missile system that now needs to engage individual warheads. Hypersonic cruise missiles like Kinzhal of Russia with speeds in excess of 5 mark and hypersonic glide vehicles like Evangrad of Russia and DF-17 of China with speeds in excess of 20 mark along with maneuverability at these speeds can make the weapon unstoppable. China has characterized this weapon as an assassin's mace, a folklore termed for a weapon that gives advantage against a better armed foe. Both the future developments of MIRV and hypersonic missiles would reduce the detectability and engagement probability of the ballistic missile defense. Thus, these weapons would be highly effective in the early stages of a war and can be utilized for directly engaging the assessed centers of gravity with an enhanced degree of assurance for successful engagement of the DMPI. Another revolutionary concept that has emerged in recent times is the weaponization of the unmanned aerial systems. From merely being a reconnaissance and surveillance resource, enabling battlefield transparency and decision-making at various levels, the UAVs have symbolized a new paradigm of warfighting, wherein pilotless aircraft can cause unprecedented levels of destruction while being remotely controlled from the confines of a heavily protected air-conditioned operational centers. However, UAV technology is presently in its infancy. Its current limitations of low speed, low range, LOS dependability and stealth are being gradually overcome through concerted research. Advanced air forces have already evolved these deficiencies and acquired weaponized male and hail, that is medium altitude, long endurance and high altitude, long endurance systems that have revolutionized the fight against terrorism. While the male and hail types of UCAVs require logistic support for its operations, smaller UAVs with lesser payloads are less dependent on op logistics. Proliferation of these smaller UAVs into the hands of non-state actors, organizations with illegal intentions like drug cartels, and erring individuals pose a unique challenge. It is due to this that this particular aerial threat I have categorized under the 
सब कन्वेंशनल द अटैक ऑन खिमीम द रशियन एयर बेस इन सीरिया इन ट्वेंटी द अटैक ऑन द सऊदी ऑयल फेसिलिटीज इन ट्वेंटी was probably by hordes of independent drones programmed with gps coordinates of the target and launched for the attack these hordes can take casualties and partial failures and still be able to inflict considerable damage by relying on saturating and overwhelming the enemy air defenses with sheer numbers israel has been using hordes of drones to overwhelm Syrian air defenses by saturating areas with more targets that can be handled however dozens of fixed wing drones flying in coordinated formation can well be the future of unmanned combat the emerging threat from swarm drones that act as a single unit sharing one distributed brain for decision making and adapting to each other the swarm is given a simple task a single task and coordination within the swarm is automatically done using software that mimics the behavior of a flock of birds however even the swarm cannot predict but only react making it presently vulnerable the real leap forward in swarming would be wherein the human says go accomplish the task and the robots in swarm communicate amongst each other distribute task and execute them having covered the evolving aerial threats i come back to the importance of space space and electronic warfare enhances the lethality and survival survivability of the aerial threats all the modern aerial threats work under the overarching umbrella of space in addition to utilization of space as a medium for the icbm and hypersonic missiles these capabilities are totally reliant on intelligent space based systems capable of providing accurate geolocation of the targets they also utilize satellite based communication and navigational inputs to successfully engage the targets the main threat in space exists in the form of denial of the use of our own space based assets for military use through a soft or a hard kill the range of air based threats is expanding with considerable speed and intensity the horizontal and vertical proliferation of technologies and weapon systems create challenges at all the three levels of military action that is strategic operational and tactical at the strat level proliferation of evolving aerial threats especially stealth technology with high stand of capability of hypersonic or hypersonic weapons make relations between two states less stable as the advance warning time reduces thereby increasing pressure on political decision making process which leads to adaptation of more aggressive doctrines the threat on the other hand from drones cannot be deterred and has to be destroyed at the operational level new concepts of mobility protection deployment and supply would have to be formulated while constantly evolving rules of engagement the drone threat has to be kinetically defended with counter drone technology at the tactical level new aerial threats are to be dealt with new tactics and training further each of the small units deployed in the field now has to develop ad capabilities especially from the threat of smaller uavs a quick neighborhood scan for the air threats which i have mentioned the slide indicates that china has ticked all the right boxes and pakistan is not very far behind i have not put india but india is also not very far behind in acquiring all these technologies the summary of aerial threats has been characterized in the three domains what needs to be understood is that the militaries are trained and equipped to fight against the threats in the conventional domain 
This needs to be broadened to evolve tackling of aerial threats in the three domains, either through deterrence in the strategic domain or through robust defense mechanisms in the subconventional domain. The probability of subconventional threat being the highest and is omnipresent, especially in this NWNP situation. Thank you. Group Captain Vishal Manotra, thank you for giving us a perspective of aerial threats, the type of uh, the arrow of aerial threats which are actually gives a challenge for the air defense uh, people, conventional, conventional and strategic air threats. So it is for the air defense planners to see how they pose to these challenges and find suitable answers. Thank you for that. And I now switch over to the uh, next speaker. Next speaker with us is uh, Colonel Kubeh. Uh, Colonel K.V. Kubeh is a Director of Defense and Aerospace with Ernst & Young, and he will speak to us on an industry perspective. A few words on uh, Colonel Kubeh. He is a super specialist in electronic warfare. He commanded an electronic warfare regiment in operations and has conducted EW operations in the Western and the Eastern Theater, both in conventional and insurgent environments. He has been an instructor at the National Defense Academy. Now I hand over to Colonel Kubert uh, for his talk. Thank you, sir. Um, thank you very much, uh, Air Marshal Krishna. One of the finest air warriors I've ever seen and a great professional. Uh, and uh, generally, we all have a very great respect for you, Amarsha Krishna. With a with a gallantry award with you, you are one of the finest over there. Um, General Bhatia, sir, ladies and gentlemen, Group Captain Malhotra did talk about uh, some something about space, and I thought I'll begin from there. Two zero one nine Mission Shakti and uh, India demonstrated its military and technological prowess in space, which is the fourth dimension. The military is heavily dependent upon C4 ISR and space-based sensors are vital to battlefield transparency. The indigenous NAVIC, which is an uh, ISRO DRDO combine, is available for, uh, it, it has been made available to the Indian Navy. There have been some development uh, in, in new space-borne detectors. The multiband uh, GSAT-7 or Rukmani, which is the first dedicated military communication satellite. GSAT-7A empowers the Air Force with networking and centric uh, structure by interlinking its airborne fleet, air bases, radar stations, AWACS, network, etc. And also equips the Army with substantial transmission mechanisms. For surveillance, we are dependent upon the Cartosat Resat series. And uh, the one that has been recently conceived by DLRL, Kautelia, 436 kg MSAT. And this is the mil military element payload trying to now dominate the electromagnetic spectrum. Well, I, I started with this just to say that this uh, entire air defense is not is not just confined to the defense against some air threats it is the domination of the of the of the fourth dimension and uh, what is interesting about uh, air defense is it is an equip equipment sensitive arm it is a technology driven arm and uh, is infested with so many technologies and generally the contemporary and the future ones and therefore it lends itself naturally attractive to industry, both large and small. Somehow, I find uh, when I see when I see the the technologies that are in for transfer, the uh, the TOT Class A technologies of DRDO, or I see some of these uh, one zero one items 
and i see some of these i find that some of we are we have not focused very much on air defense technologies which will be which will be the ones that we need to probably be focusing on given the strength of in the in indian industry in, in radars and missiles i think this is a very very good case for um, a good make in india so the equipment is generally costly it comes at the higher end of the technology spectrum and therefore budgetary planning and uh, budgetary consideration should be take, taken uh, very carefully into account so that we don't get into uh, uh, retracting of rfps and things like that so that would be very important for this uh, we have uh, our, our our dpsus like bharat electronics which have made the uh, in radar and surveillance they have made the the reporter radar the the 3d uh, tcr L, uh, the triple lr and all that and the private industry has been generally confined at component level i think it's time for us to look at the private industry in, in a slightly more focused manner we've got the lnt next that's there we've got uh, the mahindras we've, we've got the bharat i mean we've got uh, any number of uh, uh, of companies which have now come up and uh, and demonstrating technologies it's time for us to move away from the dpsu centric and and get it out onto the onto the private industry as well as far as the guns are concerned the older l70s were made by the uh, ordnance factories of course uh, they are a little technology challenged because they are a little old and uh, uh, and there is a limited capability available in critical technologies like barrel manufacturing and things like that i think we need to focus on certain certain aspects like barrel manufacturing and here is where uh, companies like bharat forge and uh, you know uh, we had this entire discussion on steel so uh, i think this is where we need to probably put in our effort um we really don't have much uh, capability in smart ammunition and precision guided ammunition which will be a major requirement for the indian air force and i think that's where we need to probably um uh, put in a little more effect so while akash was is a success is a very great success we need to probably uh, progress on the akash tir um which is a tac c3i system it's pretty slow while the indian air forces i8 triple cs has moved pretty fast so there are some very good uh, international companies out there and we have prepared a little small little report and i think it will be up for uh, for release very soon and where we have talked about uh, the capabilities of the uh, pla air force the super stealth, super stealth j20 the s400 the j31 the hypersonic light vehicles uh, the pakistani threat due to the chinese sail Uh, the MIRV is the manned and unmanned teaming MUMT. We have talked about it, and we have also talked about Indian Army uh, uh, progressively getting Bishurads, uh, Sam, uh, the uh, the SRQ, RMR, and I think it's time for to to, to fast track the Bishurad program. Uh, 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 the Bishurad is already there. We need to get the AD AD uh, uh, the the gun and missile uh, program. I think Hanwa is just about waiting for uh, a contract to be signed. and uh, i i i think these things should move a little fast um it's more than uh, defending just conventional attacks and when we talk about atmanirbharata we 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 do have you know the astra uh, the astra mark 6 the b uh, uh, the beyond the visual ram the uh, the akash uh, sam the ad tcr and uh, and also um uh, anti satellite missiles so we have given some demonstrations uh, over there and we have shown the technology uh, the technological capability of this so we have introduced of course we did talk about the saudi aramco and the 19 attacks that happened and the mq9 um, on of january 20 targeting qasim sulaimi uh, we did uh, sulaimani we did talk about the chinese exocopter uh, with uh, the m4 carbine and seven chinese grenades which was shot down by our own bsf the uh, an ntro being tasked to deploy more uh, more of herons uh, for surveillance on the lac and then i think uh, there was some discussion on the on the weaponization of the uavs we also talked about that and uh, so i think the 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 report is a little confidence we did talk about the adn sat systems in india we talked about the laboratories associated with that the asl uh, which does the dnd on solid propulsion technologies composites Uh, aerospace mechanical uh, non destructive testing we did talk about the dl uh, drdl uh, it's a it's a it does the design development of state of art missile systems aerodynamics airframe design etc 
Uh, we did talk about the ITR, which provides the safe landing launch. Uh, we did talk about the RCI, which does R&D in control engineering, inertial navigation, IR, IIR seekers, etc. We did talk about the TBRL, DND production facilities, characteristics, and all that. We have uh, pretty good companies down there. Uh, we've got BDL, we've got uh, VEM Technologies, we've got Nucon, uh, uh, which invest a lot of. I mean, these are the companies that invest a lot of money in, in contemporary technologies. They have uh, they have successfully uh, demonstrated fluid dynamics. Uh, they have successfully demonstrated uh, uh, various technologies that are useful for the Air Force and uh, in, in some very very high tech areas. Now, we have talked uh, about some key technologies like the anti-satellite missile of 283 kilometers, the naval anti-ship missile of 55 kilometers, the Pranash uh, program, which is uh, the erstwhile, uh, which is the new avatar of the Prahar, um, where the configuration is frozen and the and the design will uh, will start off early 21. Now, we did talk about the manned portable ATGM, and this is where I also want to talk about the assemble of, of WEM technologies. Um, a, a small little company over there, which is technologically invested, has come out with uh, with this uh, with this missile, and they have demo- uh, they have been showing it in uh, in the Aero Indias and the Defexpos. Uh, we did talk about the third generation Nag. We talked about the Prithvi 350, Agni 5000, BB Ram 100 kilometers, uh, QR Sam, Akash, Brahmos. So we did talk about all of these uh, uh, these companies over there, and we talked about certain key, key technologies. In terms of the of the of the development of the hypersonic version of the Brahmos air to air vision uh, air to air version uh, um, um, against AVAX capability, we talked about the ship bed version from frigates, corvettes, OPVs, and other type of uh, uh, ships, uh, which has been in induction since 2005. The army has been inducted. Uh, army has inducted it in 2007. The land version, the air force has integrated it into Su-30 MKI. Um, the submarine launch version is already ready for exports, and Philippines is standing ready um, to buy this uh, this particular missile. We have made some great progress over there. Uh, we talked about the ROE and HEMRL uh, uh, JV, which is uh, which is agreed to work on the advanced pyrotechnic pyrotechnic ignition systems, uh, which is uh, an essential requirement to develop the solid state uh, rocket motors. Uh, we did talk about the nearby and the, the DRTO's anti-drone systems that was also deployed at the Red Fort. Um, coming to market intelligence, um, uh, APAC is considered to be the area of high potential growth. Um, basically, due to the growing territorial disputes and as long as uh, countries like China exist, these d- disputes will continue to exist. Um, anybody who's greedy and grabbing power from across the region I mean, they are into territorial disputes. At least 17 countries in the in, in this region, and therefore, uh, this is uh, this is a high high potential growth area uh, for for reasons such as these, and also due to the R and D that's getting into the newer technologies. Um, you know, in 2019, the market share of the air defense market was valued at 12.35 billion dollars, and uh, the projected CAGR was around 7.02 percent. Uh, to reach a figure of $18.51 billion by, by 2025. And the missile defense systems uh, appears to have the largest market share followed by the counter UAS segment, which is uh, expected to grow pretty fast. And uh, the threat detection segment is about uh, $5.48 billion uh, in 2019, expected to grow but uh, to about uh, $8.93 billion. Uh, the threat detection segment is all about the radars, the EOIR, IFF, and, 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 and lightweight solutions. And uh, then we talk about the countermeasures. The countermeasures uh, segment itself, uh, which is which consists of the guns, rockets, missiles, and the directed energy weapons, um, was standing at around uh, $6.86 billion in 2019 and expected to grow the $9.58 billion by, by, by 2025. Um, in 2018, India conducted the interceptor missile uh, tests as part of the two-layer ballistic missile defense systems. The Prithvi defense vehicle is planned to destroy targets at altitude at, uh, at 50 kilometers. Uh, we did mention the Indra uh, air defense, um, you know, which was, uh, again, $0.58 billion. The, 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 sorry, the, the Indian air defense uh, segment, uh, which is pegged at $0.58 billion now, to proceed to about uh, 0.92 billion dollars by 2025, 
with a 7.9 uh, CAGR. Uh, we actually gave a good shot at uh, Atmanirbhar Bharat, talked about the FDI, the, the notification is yet to come, of course, on the 74%, uh, the 101 items. While I talk of the 101 items, I'm, I'm actually uh, intrigued and uh, I really like the, the presentation made by Saloha um, uh, from, from Amit, Amit, Amit Jawade. In fact, uh, uh, this is a point that I've always been having and... Um, uh, there are some raw materials in India that uh, we make and we make it very well. Um, steel still has a very good potential because it's applied across uh, the three services and there is a great potential of application of steel. While even in aluminium, um, uh, companies like Hidalgo, uh, which is the Aditya Birla Group, they've also done pretty well and, you know, they've they made an investment of more than about 7,000 crores in getting the latest technologies and they're just standing on the verge of another 3,500 crores more and then we will be, uh, we will, we would have uh, mastered the entire technology and the, and the production of aluminium. So talking about this, I'm surprised that raw materials do not find a place in the 101 items. And I would urge the services, um, the, the Ministry of Defense and the think tanks like Senjos to actually uh, showcase this capability of, uh, of the country. Although it does get a mention in the DAP 2020, but that's not good enough. It should be in a. It should be. It should be a BNE. It should be. Uh, in fact, what the the recommendations given by Amit are, um, I would say, conservative. We have to be a little more aggressive and say if it is in India, we don't buy it from anywhere else. So the uh, the prime contractor, uh, whoever the Indian Armed, Armed Forces contract, should not have the choice to buy it again from China, and that will be a shame uh, when we have the capability next door and we can we can work out the economics around that. We talk about the 108 items which was announced by the DRDO and although it's no excitement but uh, yes there is there is some uh, there is some movement forward over there we did talk about the capital budget uh, the in indigenous portion of that coming to about 52,000 crores as as indicated by the Raksha Mantri in one of the other seminars um, the the uh, with the corporatization of the ordnance factories uh, the setting up of the project management unit in the in the in the in the service headquarters and in the MOD to fast track some of the acquisitions. Uh, we didn't talk about the public procurement order of 127 items, which are uh, irrespective of the of the uh, uh, cost. They will be only for for local procurement. Uh, we did talk about the launching of this region and the NIIO. Uh, there are a few challenges. Uh, some of them were addressed a little while early uh, earlier. Uh, the increased reliance on stealth by aircraft, UAVs, PGMs, rockets, uh, integra integration and interoperability becomes a challenge. And uh, a nation's uh, security vulnerabilities are normally uh, uh, are, are, are normally taking the center stage. And as an example, I can tell you this, that the U.S. plan to adopt the Iron Dome um, uh, missile defense system. And due to a compatibility issue, uh, they actually they dropped it off in March. It was actually, uh, uh, they earmarked a uh, billion dollars uh, to select and integrate uh, uh, the Iron Dome uh, with the U.S. integrated battle command systems by 2023. And that has been shelved right now. And Raytheon Rafael, uh, a joint venture, which is being formed uh, to build an Iron Dome for the U.S. Um, and this is, I think, this company is called as the Raytheon Rafael um, um, Protection Systems. And they will build the Iron Dome systems. They will build the Tamir interceptor and launcher, uh, the Sky Hunter missiles and the cruise missiles, unmanned aircrafts, rockets, artillery, motor, etc. So I think uh, uh, we we did give a, a glimpse of how 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 geopolitics itself would uh, is a challenge. Say, for example, the ongoing issue between uh, U.S. and Turkey regarding the procurement of S-400. And sometimes I see some uh, some some small little uh, snippets in the media saying that India also should not buy. And uh, uh, very proud to see that India has taken a great stance that we will go ahead with our S-400. Uh, uh, and and we, we maintain our relationships independently with, with the U.S. And, uh, uh, and, and these are some very good stances that we take. And... Uh, and I'm, I have a funny feeling U.S. will fall in line and all those uh, things will, uh, I mean, they would understand two great democracies need to probably understand each other. And, and therefore, that should be a non-issue. Uh, we didn't talk about the volatility of the Indian neighborhood. 
um, which uh, brings in heavy demands. Like I said, uh, when when countries like China exist, there's no issues. I mean, these things would be in high demand, like the ASMS, the weapons, uh, the the surveillance, the radar, and, and C4I2, and uh, and and I think the 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 chief of defense staff earlier in the day talked about the air defense command. Um, uh, we we need to probably take care of the integration issues between the civil and military and um, um, access to technologies will always remain a challenge and therefore um, therefore we need to find ways of uh, of organic and non organic uh, a, a very healthy combination of organic and, and non organic route uh, to take on uh, technology challenges and to that extent i think our idex um, which is which is a technology challenge and we have been talking about this for a, for more than a decade, and ultimately it came up in 2016, thanks to uh, thanks to Mr. Parikar and you know uh, then uh, uh, then Defence Minister Ms., uh, Ms. Asida Raman. So I think uh, some of these challenges, when thrown open to the industry, they produce some brilliant results, and then uh, we are seeing some very good uh, um, uh, good things. Like I tell you, uh, I, I've just seen some contracts which were like the the medium power radars, the HAROPS, the AS, a, ARSR, the LLTR, Herons, so Mika, uh, the NGPGM, EOIR, the two troops, the CCMs, the uh, uh, the, the augmentation of the barracks, uh, harpoons, meat, and uh, this is where I found that while we did have a bi global procurement of meat from Quintech. Um, uh, we have launched a Make 2 program and the Make 2 program has progressed to a level that uh, the RFP has been issued to Indian companies and and we have about more than a dozen companies out there which say that they can do this and that's that's uh, that's an achievement. Well, that's not, not good enough, but yes, we need to, that's, that's still good. And we need to, in fact, uh, see the other things also because I see the ADFCR, uh, the 70 mm rockets. So there are a number of these things that we need to start looking inward and, and get this going. So as a way forward, it's great to see the Indian Air Force planning to integrate uh, uh, integrate the Astra with the 272 Sukhoi 30 MK, MKIs that we have. Um, the 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 upgraded uh, uh, Rafale, uh, uh, you know, Derby uh, ER um, BVRAM 100 kilometers, you know. It, uh, the, these are uh, complementary. It, 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 it complements each other, and therefore we have a very good power out there in the sky. And uh, the the ADE is also developing an air launched variant of the LR LACM uh, sea skimming capability for the Air Force and the Navy. Uh, the S four hundred, of course, uh, signed and will be inducted. I believe by twenty twenty one, induction will start. Um, February twenty also one one great thing happened that the U S cleared the. Uh, the uh, IADWS, the uh, the the air defense uh, weapon shield for the NCR, which is pegged at about uh, 1.87 billion dollars, and uh, I think that's in a very advanced stage of uh, of procurement, and I I, I think uh, very soon Delhi will be safe. Um, then we had this uh, the Defexpo BDL uh, launched the Amoga three with third generation ATGM. And I did talk about Newcon and Vem, which are also great companies down there in Hyderabad. Um, and in July 20, again, I see IAF uh, did uh, did procure from emergency powers uh, hammers, the highly agile modular munition extended range for the Rafales under the emergency powers, a few hundred of them. And uh, this is where I see that, uh, you know, we, we have, uh, we are progressing towards, uh, towards a very safe and, uh, and a very potent uh, air defense and this uh, these are going to be pretty pretty handy and I think China is getting the message somewhere down there. Um, the Helena is uh, has been in for trials in July 2020. Uh, it's called Druvastra now. Uh, the helicopter launched one. The Druvastra is direct to top attack mode, and uh, we did talk about the mission Shakti and uh, what again I would say that we need to put more of these technologies for transfer to Indian companies. And, and and that is the way, that is the surest way that we will have that uh, Indian large private players uh, coming into this game and uh, supporting the Indian Armed Forces um, and uh, supporting Indian Armed Forces in achieving self-reliance. And um, this is a very important aspect because no country, uh, all the, no country can, can rely only on a set of industries 
and this has to expand. We, we, we need to have an inclusive industry out there and, and welcome the private players into the fold. And, and it should be a complementary uh, strategy between the, uh, the, the government companies uh, the, and, and, the, and the private sector. Thank you very much. Uh, Colonel Kubesa, thank you. I mean, uh, you covered a vast canvas of issues and the industry perspective. It was hearty to listen that how you talked about the battlefield transparency, need for contemporary technology, and how air defense needs the high-end technology and, uh, and should be futuristic. And the fact that makes attractive to the industry is uh, actually rings bells in my ears. Because uh, that is very important to us, as you said, air defense is uh, is a very important tool for any nation. I think what we need to take away is the, to leap away from the traditional way of doing business and the role of private industry. And I do agree with you, there are ample opportunities for the industry to grab the capabilities that the armed forces are looking at in the present juncture. And the... Other important aspect which you did touch upon is the need of raw materials where we need to indigenize. And I do agree with you, sir, that steel and aluminium, that what the what Amit had covered and Hindalco is doing in aluminium, I think it will help our industry to be able to get these raw materials from our own indigenous resources. The numbers you spoke about that air defense and missile systems, nearly 12.35 billion trillion dollar market is huge. And the potential there is immense for our industries. The need for uh, technology challenges and the IDEX has been a good uh, way of how startups can support the armed forces. And I once again like to thank you for having given this perspective. And we look forward to the private industry making a bigger role in supporting armed forces. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you. thank you so much for having found the time to be with us and uh, added luster to this uh, event. And thanks to all the other speakers for having given words of wisdom. Thank you very much. We will start the next session at 3 o'clock and see you back here. Thank you all. Sir, thank thank you. you, sir. And thank you all the panelists for the nice talk you all gave. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, thank you, you very much. much. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Sir. Thank you. Thank you, Amit. Good. Thank you, Brigadier. Thank you, sir. Sure. Thank you. Bye.